Hey guys, JB here from Alpha Wolf Consulting, coming to you today with another episode of Understanding Thyself. And this episode is all about knowing my self worth. So, knowing my worth. And in this episode, we're going to, I'm just going to talk about some understandings and realizations I've had over the last couple of weeks and months just around understanding and really understanding my self-worth, okay? And, and what that sort of means and, and how I practice, you know, showing myself my understanding of self-worth. And it's, it's really important because, like, it's easy for us to sort of you know, say, I have self-worth, but then act against ourselves. And that's, and that's one big thing that I do a lot with myself is, you know, it's, it's typically not other people acting against me. It's me acting against myself, if, if that sort of makes sense. So, you know, an important f thing for me personally to learn was how to set boundaries and sort of how to enforce my boundaries with others so that they may know what my boundaries are, but also how to respect my boundaries. Because a big realization I had throughout my life was for the majority of my life, I never really set boundaries with others. You know, like I would have some boundaries that I set, but then I would always work against them. And the reason for this for me personally is because I have low self-esteem issues, I have low self-worth issues, or I did, and I had codependency issues. Now, these issues all stem from growing up around narcissists because to me and in my experience, a narcissist enforces their beliefs on others at the detriment of others' beliefs. So, growing up, you know, a lot of the adult figures in my life would enforce beliefs upon me that were not my own. Things like, you know, if I didn't think, believe, or act exactly how they wanted me to, they would try to tear me down to, in, to sort of break my spirit so that I would comply with what they wanted me to do in life and what who they wanted me to be in life. And a funny thing for me is, you know, I personally started, you know, working full time when I was maybe 14 and a half. So when I went into the workforce, I had not yet developed the sense of self or the understanding of who I was. So I was very, very malleable to the influence of those who I perceived to be above me. So, so those who were older than me, those who were in positions of, you know, power, you know, your bosses, your managers, and things like that. And a thing that would always, or a reoccurring um, instant that would always happen for me, would be people, or these people in power, trying to force their values on me at the detriment of my own values. And for a lot of my life, in my working career, I accepted their values above my own. So what do I sort of mean by that? Well, when I worked in sales, okay, a lot of my managers and bosses wanted to make money and they didn't care about damaging relationships with their buyers, about misleading or misusing the positions that they had and the information and the knowledge that they had to the detriment of their, 
you know, their buyers, of their customers. And this is one very, very big value that I hold within myself that I refuse and have always refused to break is that I don't manipulate or mislead other people because when I was young, I did that between the ages of, you know, 16, well not 16, but between the ages of 18 and like 24, 25. I was willing to sacrifice who I was to achieve what I wanted to achieve in life, to achieve success, to achieve financial abundance. So I would put my values and beliefs to the side and I would believe what they were telling me as being true and right. And I would manipulate people. I would mislead people. So a funny thing in sales is a lot of very, very low quality and negative sales people talk about the theatrics of sales. That if I make things look and seem more difficult than they are, I can manipulate people into needing me because I'm confusing them to where they feel disempowered to do it on their own. This was a tactic that a lot of employers that I worked for would use. To the same, when working in um, hospitality and in cooking, a lot of the businesses and restaurants and things like that that I worked for would use low quality products and then charge high high prices for their product. So we were using subpar fruits, vegetables, meats, and then charging a premium price for the product. Or we were doing subpar products and charging a premium price. And that just goes against my internal personal belief. But a big thing was more around the sales, more around when you're in a position of power over someone, you have a fiduciary responsibility or an onus to protect and serve that person. So if I understand how to manipulate your psychology, the responsibility is on me to not manipulate your sub, your your psychology, your subconscious mind. And this was something that I personally had to battle with. And the funny thing was, when I was, you know, putting my values to the side and taking actions that did not align to me, I lost myself. To the same in relationships. At an early age, in my, in my early 20s, I understood that with dating and courtship and, you know, women and girls, if I tell you what you want to hear and I create a persona of who you are looking for, I can manipulate you into believing that I am the person you are looking for to get my own gratification, to get my own needs filled. For many years did I do this. For many years did I manipulate people. And the funny thing was, by doing this, I lost who I was. I became a shell of who I was. Have you ever woken up in your life and just looked in the mirror and realized you hate who you've become? Because who you become is so far skewed from who you wanted to be in life, who you see yourself as. Growing up with narcissisms, uh, not narcissism, but narcissistic people throughout my childhood led me to believe being narcissistic was the way to succeed in life, the way to get what I want in life. 
at the detriment of other people. It's quite funny because in doing this and experience this, experiencing this and going through this, I came to the realization that I would rather fail and die being authentically myself than sacrifice myself for any level of success. If you've ever wondered or, or been worried about becoming corrupted or being corrupt in life, it comes from a fear of not being able to stand true to who you are when push comes to shove. When push comes to shove, you know, am I someone who is willing to die by my sword for what I believe in? Or am I someone who's going to turn coat and change sides to be on the side of victory? It's a funny thing. Because for the earlier part in my life, that is what I would do. I would go with whatever the majority was saying, whatever the majority was doing. I sacrificed who I individually was to be a part of the majority. And this led me to create a lot of fears and a lot of beliefs within myself that made me afraid of who I was. Because who I was does not align to what the majority think, feel, and believe in life as being real. If others think, you know, sacrificing your ethics, you know, to, to just get the job done, to, to get ahead is acceptable, I refuse to accept that as being true. I would rather die being authentically me happy than to live an eternity sacrificing my individual individuality and my authenticity to be you know accepted and loved by the crowd so in my early years i learned how to create and wear masks we all do have you experienced this where we create personas of who we need to be to become the, you know, the version of success that we seek. In love, I would sacrifice who I was to be accepted by my partner. In career, I would sacrifice my values to get ahead. So what do I mean by that? Well, a funny thing you'll notice, especially, you know, in your own experience, is that we are two times more likely to respond to negative information and negative stimuli than we are to positive. What this means is if I use your psychology, so my understanding that if I always present you with negativity, you will feel an urge and a need to respond to that negativity. So, like, think about the media. Think about the news. Think about social media. Think about YouTube. All the content that's created on there. I see it so much, you know, across these different platforms where we focus on the negative so that we can you know get the attention we create these masks have you have you noticed if you've you know been on youtube and you and you watch streamers have you ever noticed how the streamers are just like the majority of them sell out who they are in terms of they create this character, this over-the-top character. They create, you know, false drama. They become over-dramatic. They gossip. They, you know, 
they do all this weird stuff. Like right now with these young streamers, they're all pretending to be gay to get attention because the cultural shift is to the woke movement of accepting gay. To accept someone's sexual preference is just to accept them for who they are. It doesn't mean I have to reenact how they are or their beliefs to be accepted by them. But the, these people all do. You'll notice it if you watch it, that most who trend in life, who are popular, typically aren't being authentically themselves because it's only the minute or the minority who are willing to be themselves that become popular for who they are. The others become popular for being on the trend, for being on, you know, the, the cultural shift. And it's so funny because in living a life that way, we forget what life means to us. Does that make sense? So, like, if you think about society and you think about, you know, like, let's just take toxic masculinity. Over the past 10 years, there's been a campaign against men, against masculinity and what positive masculinity is and what toxic masculinity is. And we've seen a shift and decline in how men portray themselves, but also the values those men hold. So things like, you know, protecting those who are weaker than you. That's what it means to be masculine, is that you stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. You protect and serve those in your community however you can. For example, if you have physical strength, and someone needs help, you help them. Maybe they need something lifted. Have you seen that, like, the, the weaker in society, like the elderly and the sick, are misused, are abused? Like, people, or, or weak people, attack elderly people. And, you know, they're, they're claiming that it's out of this, you know, them being masculine. So, like, for example, what I mean by this is if we take an understanding of crime and gangs. We have youth gangs that roll around that victimize people. They break into their houses and assault and attack them. But they do not prey on those who can defend themselves and who are strong. They prey on those who are weak. Not to say these people are weak, but to say those who don't have the capacity to defend themselves, like an 80-year-old grandmother. To every man out there that should disgust you, and that should make you want to take action against these people, because it is not acceptable in society, even if it's become acceptable. The woke movement is trying to make pedophilia and sexual abuse and sexual assault just known as a new form of mental illness and it should be accepted. These people should be accepted in society. That is not right. Like, that is not acceptable. But regardless... Like, these are just some examples of when we go with the trend, okay? And if we understand a trend, a trend is just a direction of societal belief or societal behavior. For example, in the 90s, if you saw people fighting, the trend was to try and separate and break up that fight. In the mid-2000s, 
if you see a fight, the trend is to videotape it and to record it and upload it so that you can get attention.